So we're talking about the future of media and storytelling. And um, I've got a bunch of questions to ask this group of very distinguished journalists and humans. Um, but I would ask you to hold your questions to the end if you don't mind. We will leave lots of time for them. Okay? Are we all comfortable and set up? All right, do you want to lead us off, Mackay? Sure, I, did, I didn't know that journalists uh, and humans were the same thing. We're not the same. Not usually no. the response we get from audiences. That's nice to hear. <laughs> uh, my name is Mackay Taggart. I'm the uh, news director at Global News here in Toronto. I uh, oversee our editorial uh, teams, both for our broadcast and online uh, uh, news in, uh, in Toronto and Ontario. Uh, we're actually a, uh, a part of the Chorus family. Um, and. Uh, the, uh, the, the news division encompasses 800 journalists uh, across the country, and I uh, work with about 120 of us uh, here in, in Toronto. That's, uh, that's my background. Andrew? Hi, I'm uh, Andrew Lundy. I'm the Vice President of Digital for the Canadian Press uh, here in Toronto. Um, if you don't know what Canadian Press is, CP, we sell uh, our content to pretty much every Canadian news outlet that there is. We are the ones who bring you your international news and your sports and your business and all the things that aren't really hyper-local. Um, so I've been there about five years. I run the digital um, operations, which is both on the, the product side, so making um, things like uh, apps for you, but also on the, uh, on the content generation side, digital storytelling, which we're going to talk about. Um, started my career in journalism back in 1990. Um, that's dating myself a little too much uncomfortably. <laughs> um, then spent eight years as a newspaper reporter, but jumped over to digital in 98 and started at CBC. I worked with Angela for a few years. Um, and I've been at, uh, at MSN um, and at Global. Uh, Mackay and I kind of shipped passing in the night there where I, I ran sort of Global News online operations until 2012. Jason. My name is Jason. I'm, oh, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm the Director of Business Development and Strategic Partnerships at Now Magazine. Uh, my work at Now is tied to just uh, diversifying, uh, diversifying our revenue. Uh, and really looking at all the different ways that we can expand uh, what we do as a media company. So looking at things like a lot of custom content, custom digital, uh, looking at e-commerce, ticketing solutions, marketing solutions, et cetera. So that's basically what I've been doing. I've been now for about two years, and I've been sort of leading this big digital transformation of that company, and hopefully we will be successful doing that. That's the hope. We're all rooting for you. Asma. Hi, um, I'm Asma Malik. I'm a professor of journalism at Ryerson. Um, my focus in teaching and research is entrepreneurship in journalism, as well as digital journalism, and we will discuss what that means, or does it mean. Um, and uh, before I came to Ryerson, I was a journalist uh, for almost 20 years at the Toronto Star and Montreal Gazette, where over those years, my job shifted from being purely print to really moving over to the digital side and thinking strategically about how uh, news organizations should be deploying their not such big resources, but uh, yeah. Okay, so I had a question that was gonna be my first question today, and I thought this was gonna be the choir that would entirely agree with me, but it turns out talking in the back room, I don't know if we are, but here was my thought. This is the choir that should be on my side about this, that we no longer separate out digital media and the rest of it, because I believe, and I'm gonna say it right now, I don't believe there is a digital media and a separate media. I think there is the content we create, the storytelling we do, have at it. <laughs> well, I can, I can start just having um, uh, this, I'm also director of the graduate journalism program at Ryerson and um, this year we've completely overhauled our 10 year old graduate program which was very much in which students had choice of learning th two of three skills, digital, broadcast and um, long form and um, we've really taken it away, taken those platforms away, really looked at the form of the work, is it long form, is it news, is it, you know, what, how, how is it all digital, really, integrating that into all of that. So, yes, I agree with you. Two on my side, awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm on your side too, Angela. Thank God, all right. Theoretically, but in the real world, and I've got experience with lots of newsrooms, and now at CPIC, I have insight into pretty much every newsroom in the country, and I can tell you that that divide is still there, and it's a huge impediment to progress. Um, whether we're in, you know, bringing new uh, you know, people that Osmond teaches are going into that, that workforce, but they're hitting a cultural wall in most of these places. So uh, most newspapers in this country pay really scant attention to the digital audience. Um, go on any website and see what that UX experience is like. Go onto their mobile product to see how they're addressing the needs of people that get their news you know, through iPhones and, and Androids. Um, 
look at broadcasters, and you know, no offense to Global Effect, I would say Global and CBC are kind of ahead of the curve, but look at how they still match their news to the broadcast operations. The, 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 the 6 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news, the morning shows are still the centers of activity and when stories are generated and, and broadcast. Um, and it informs even how you tell the stories. If you work for a newspaper, you're going to tell that story with print. You're not going to think about the visuals in it. So I've seen business reporters who will sit down and write uh, 600 words, and half of them are numbers and comparative numbers, which just cry out for charts, cry out for an interactive, um, massive data dumps that they just sort of pour out to you, and rather than parsing it. So there's an immense potential there to tell stories. I think the public, you know, what you see the activities on Facebook or Twitter, what they look for are new methods of storytelling. What I see our media producing, it's not that. And I think that's a huge reason why they're falling behind and they don't make money. I, I, agree, with, I agree with Andrew, and I think that we're our own worst enemy in this regard. And oftentimes, I'll talk to a lot of young journalists coming out of university looking to get uh, their start in the industry, and they say, I want to be on TV. I want to be a TV reporter. And I'll often ask them, well, do you have cable? And they always say, no, <laughs> but you know, I know that TV is where I want to be. Well, why do you want to be, you know, if you, if, you're, you, if you yourself aren't consuming conventional media, why do you want to work in a conventional sphere? But I think there is historically this idea, global news, global is thought of as a television station, even though the way our audiences engage with our product is largely not on TV anymore. Uh, and and we, we are sometimes the last to realize that. And I think that uh, that's reinforced to the, uh, by the fact that from a revenue perspective, and, and Jason can probably speak to this better, but from a revenue perspective, our traditional TV platform still makes us more money. And so until that revenue catches up and, and until online's driving our bottom line, uh, which it hopefully will one day, but isn't yet, uh, I think we're going to be still slow to change and adopt that, that uh, unsiloed approach. Agree. Yeah, and I think that's, that is something that I find really interesting about just the, in terms of media, I, in terms of how I even consume content, it's mostly digital. And I find that when I consume news, I don't even consume news from reporters. I don't even consume news from news organizations. I find that a lot of my news that I get is I get most of my news from Instagram. A lot of it is a series of memes. So it's basically the headlines filtered through a really interesting way that we're looking at culture now. And I find that really interesting. So it's almost like I know a lot about the world, but then no one's writing about that and telling me about it through these news organizations. And you're so right about sort of the divide in terms of just the different types of media. Like, I mean, at now, when I started it now, it's like, yeah, like I had a very specific relationship with that print product. I actually didn't read it very much. And there's a very specific interaction you have when you pick up the paper from the box, you take it in and you read it. That's kind of gone. Now, all of a sudden, people are encountering media companies and brands in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of really small brand encounters. And then the composition of all those brand encounters is how that company occupies your imagination. So it's like, I remember I interviewed someone for a job to be my engagement manager now. And they're like, yeah, you know, great. I love you guys on social. Oh, so do you, do you read the magazine? You have a magazine? That is amazing. Where can I find it? Oh, it's in a box on the street. What? what? Man, but I love your Instagram. So it's this thing. Where it's like, okay, so now all of a sudden it's like, okay, so we're a news organization and we have to treat every single part of our platform as a publishing platform, as a storytelling platform, because sometimes their only encounter with us is going to be Twitter. So it has to be something that's really, really meaningful. Um, for that person. So let's talk about that culture because you're right, the culture outside our newsrooms and the culture inside our newsrooms are completely different things. I was talking to a guy from the Atlantic last month and he was telling me how the newsroom had switched from 30% writing for the web and 70% writing for the magazine to the opposite. Now it's 70% doing the web and 30% writing for the magazine, which is all really interesting, but what do you think about as leaders in, in your newsrooms or in, with all these students in front of you, what is it you work on to try to change that so that our culture reflects the outside culture? I would say the biggest thing for us has been getting students to understand audience because I think they, you know, to Mackay's point, I completely, we, I've had those conversations with students where I'm like, do you watch the national? Why do you want to be on the national? Um, you know, I, I, we really are spending more time trying to understand reader engagement, understanding how to connect with the audience, and for such a long time, like print traditional, traditional legacy journalists have been so used to having this kind of, they don't have to care about who's reading, what, like who they're writing for, never really a question that people asked. And I think for us, really trying to get students to think about that right from the outset, like is, has been the hugest, hugest, 
biggest culture shift um, that, uh, that's gone on uh, for us anyway. That's... If you're quoting Asma, she said biggest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, I think that uh, also empowering field crews, I mean, for, as, a, as a person who manages a big local news team, uh, and the vast majority of our news gatherers spend their days in the field, making sure that they have the uh, authority, the um, editorial independence, and the technical tools to be able to disseminate information from where they gather that information. And historically, especially TV, I, I, my career started in radio, and I always compared working in radio to working in TV, like driving a little Zodiac or a little dinghy to trying to pilot the Titanic, and making a, a change or, or getting something on the air on TV takes a huge lift. And so trying to strip away that, uh, the difficulties that field crews face getting information out to the public, and digital media is a great, you know, it, it has uh, reduced a lot of the barriers. What it hasn't done though is, um, or, or shouldn't do, is then also take away those checks and balances that are important to the journalistic process. So it's balancing those two things about, you see something and you, and you tweet it out, is, is that journalism or, uh, or is adding context and perspective and, and fact to it? journalism and can you do that in a timely manner without having to get material back to a edit suite and have five people take a look at it. Jason is nodding and shaking his head at the same time which makes me confused. What are you thinking? No, I'm, I'm thinking about like it, what's so awesome about all these platforms too is that it's just other ways for us to cover things. So like, for example like there's like a really cool pop-up like, on Queen West and it's like the weekends pop-up. Like I can send a journalist down there to wait in line and cover it or I can just send my promo person down there and do an Instagram story. We get just as much engagement in doing that, and I don't have to invest in sort of the journalism side of it. And then there's that whole bit, too, about what happens with the speed at these platforms. Like, whenever news breaks online, I don't believe any of it until, like, a source like the Associated Press says it. So I remember when Prince died? I didn't believe Prince died. I would look at when Trump won. I didn't believe Trump won until I saw an organization that I kind of believed. So there's something about that, too, that's happening with all these different platforms the speed at which we're moving, and I don't believe any of it. Andrew was just really arguing about this, actually. Charlie Rose, do you want to talk a little bit about what you just said to me about Charlie Rose? What did I say about Charlie Rose? Remember we were talking about Charlie Rose and how he has a new show, supposedly? Oh, yeah. We so, haven't confirmed so, it. So, yeah, they, yeah, we were chatting about like, who's going to watch this. And my question, actually, is, is it really happening? Because every media outlet around is actually reporting this. But if you actually read the stories, they're all referring back to the New York Post, page 6 which is a bit of a gossip column, and they're pretty accurate, but they're not 100% accurate. But everybody's going with it as if it's an ironclad truth. I'm not sure any of those other organizations actually try to reach Charlie Rose or called up the, the, you know, the producers that are being named with it. Um, they're just putting it out there, and it really does damage our credibility. And sure, certainly in, a, in an environment where we're being challenged to make money and to get audience to pay, pay attention, when we sacrifice the trust, which is really, a, in the many ways, all we have left is traditional media, when we sacrifice that, we have nothing. Then it is going to be the Kardashians posting on Instagram that are going to be the way you get your information. And, you know, for good or bad, some of it's good, but that's not how I want to find out about the federal budget. Well, let's talk about that, the fact that digital media often gets blamed for the fact that so much stuff is unconfirmed. What do we do to fight that? Well, I mean, we, we face that all the time. Um, and there are countless examples of times when TMZ has broken a story and then newsrooms across the country, around the world, are chasing and trying to think, okay, TMZ has it, do we go with it? The most recent one I can think of from a local perspective was when Roy Holiday, the former Jays pitcher, died in a, in a plane crash in Florida, and, and TMZ was the first to have that. They had video, they, had, they didn't have any confirmation, but it was enough that met the TMZ standards, which are here. Uh, and, and you have to sort of think about, because at a certain point, it's great that we have these tried and tested values and that we stand by them and we're really proud of ourselves, but if, if people aren't coming to us, for information anymore because we are an hour or two behind. There, there is a balance there. You, you, trust is certainly what we trade in, but we also p need to be cognizant of, of how quickly people want to consume information. You know, what's interesting about the TMZ story and the, the emergence of other players is, um, you know, the digital has it's kind of democratized who can tell news. It's no longer just the New York Times or the Globe and Mail. And TMZ, the National Enquirer, have started breaking news, and they've done it with traditional journalism, just because we don't trust that it's a brand we don't really know, or they will put you know, a crazy photo gallery up next to something that's more important. Um, you know, TMZ gets its stuff and locks it down the same way that any journalist does. They, they work their sources. I mean, TMZ has, has contacts in every hospital in LA, in every, you know, all the EMT people. So when Michael Jackson died, 
they knew because somebody called them just like we would know if uh, something was happening on Parliament Hill because we're friends with you know the, the deputy minister um, same with when the National Enquirer broke the John Edwards story back I don't know if you remember you know, how many of you are old enough to remember this but it was during the 2004 um, presidential or the primaries um, and everyone wants the Enquirer come on and it actually turned out to be true because they did exactly the same thing they worked the sources they had the documentary evidence and you know it's too bad it was in the Enquirer because it took weeks for other media to trust it and jump on that but the democratization of, of the ability to get information and then put that out there to the world has actually changed it for us we have competitors now that we never had before I think, it, I, I think um, it, it's definitely compounded the issue of organizations reporting on other organizations. I mean, I'm just thinking about Monday, and the tragedy here in Toronto, um, you know, where a CBC reporter um, was watching a live interview on TV, a local television station, and made a comment that, you know, uh, about what the witness was saying about, you know, the, uh, the, who the, what the suspect looked Middle Eastern or whatever the comment was. And that tweet, which was, you know, report, re, it was an original reporting. It was, I mean, whatever, whatever you want to say about um, the nature of the tweet and whether that should have been tweeted. But that tweet had a life of its own, and it kind of went on. And really, it was only when another reporter tweeted that, oh, I watched this on city, you know, on city TV or whatever, that it became clear what the provenance of that, even that witness report was. So it gets so far removed from the original content that untangling that is just not easy. I mean, it's, it's challenging because so many news organizations are pressed for resources and they're reporting off of social media and that becomes a story. And it's the transparency and really everyone looks the same like on Twitter. You can't really evaluate, I mean, unless you're, you know, someone who pays attention to these things, which we hope journalists are, but you can't really, you know, untangle what's real and what's not and real. I, I think that you bring up a really good point because it's, it sort of goes back to sourcing. And this is uh, like a lot of journalists in the province right now. I'm embedded in our coverage of the upcoming provincial election. And for the first time, I think, ever, every campaign has bought their own what's called a de, de Gero, which is a uh, digital tool used for disseminating video. It's basically seven cell phones strapped together in a briefcase. <laughs> but it creates a broadcast quality video feed. And every TV network in the, in the country now owns these. But for the first time ever, the parties have each bought one. So now the parties basically have their own TV network, so their own satellite truck that they are bringing with them on the campaign trail and will be broadcasting this on their social platforms and allowing any media outlet they, they want to take that feed for free. And so you So it's now, like a pool. So it's kind so of like a pool, except uh, a pool is coordinated by the, by the media outlets. This is uh, just provided by the party. So they'll show you what they want you to see, and then they'll shut off that feed when they don't want you to see what, what's happening next. And that's concerning because I think audiences, especially if you're consuming something on Twitter or on Periscope or on Facebook, you don't necessarily know that source. You don't know that, that camera is actually being held by someone paid by the PC party or by the liberals. And I do think that there's, you know, to put on my capital J journalist hat for a second, there's some concern in, in decisions like that. And digital technology and digital media has become, I don't want to say too accessible, but so accessible that people who aren't journalists and, and media organizations can, can use it. And I, and I love that idea about like just this idea of like a tweet that just goes and becomes news on its own. There's something really fascinating about just the fact that social media, just in terms of the scale and the scope and some of the, the reach that some of these influencers have, for example. It's like I remember like Kylie Jenner posted on Twitter, does anyone else not go on Snapchat either? And Snapchat's value plummeted by billions of dollars and that became a news story. And I learned about the news story on Instagram through an infograph. So it's like... Meta. Is that even news? I don't even know what that was, but that's this thing where it's like, man, but that was like, that was hot. So it's, and that's the thing too about this idea of like, it's true, there's this like, when you look, when you think about like coverage too, it's like, you know, how do you create, especially when you have trust, right? Like people are scrolling through 400 feet of news feed a day, like on their phones. It's like, how do you break through? Well, trust, you break through there, you break through with good content, but at the same time, it's like, sometimes what breaks through is not that great. So like we end up, sometimes we get into big, big debates, like you're in like an editorial, editorial board and it's like, man, who should we put on the cover? Should we put the response from Black Lives Matter at Pride or barbecue issue? <laughs> Barbecues kill, they're so great. Engagement, right? There's great engagement when there it comes is. to barbecue season. But that's rough, that's a rough combo to have and, and that's a combo that we have a lot. It's every newsroom is going through that. I mean, one of the things, I've worked in breaking news for a lot of my years as a journalist, but 
Working at the Walrus, what's nice is that we're a monthly magazine, so when news breaks, we're all excited about it as journalists, we need to cover it, but we're not thinking about how to cover it in the moment, and I actually like that myself. Right now, it's enjoyable. Um, but how do you, as your, how has your newsroom changed now that breaking news is something you are competing with every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the internets? Uh, for CP, um, you mentioned Associated Press as far as a trust, and we are that in Canada. We know that a lot of our clients will not run with a story, will not tweet a story until we do. And we respect that role that we play. It can be very frustrating because we can hold on to something for an hour yeah. and we can see Twitter lighting up with so-called confirmations, which aren't confirmations at all, but we haven't nailed it down yet. I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, um, 2014, Farley Mowat died. Um, and, you know, we saw that on Twitter and um, we were trying to confirm. We couldn't get his agent. We finally got a hold of his brother, and this was a half an hour into the arc, which is, you know, about 100 years in internet time. And his brother said, yeah, it's really sad, I'm not sure where he is. And we're like, wait, wait a minute, what do you mean? Uh, and his, his brother was older and maybe had a little bit of, you know, dementia issues, and we couldn't nail it down. So like, we thought, oh, we have his brother, well, we don't know. We don't know if Farley's alive or dead or just on vacation. And we always had the Gordon Lightfoot thing in mind. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, and Makai and I were working for the same company that sort of put that out there, that Gordon Lightfoot was dead while he was on the radio saying, actually, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> um, so anyway, so back to like, the Canadian press will be often not last, but will not be first, but right. And right for us is uh, a differentiator. It's a value proposition, and we sell that. When we try to sell our content to, to clients, we say, we, well, we, we're, not, we're not perfect, but we'll never rush to judgment for something. We're also playing the long game too, I think, to some degree. I mean, these are, these are news organizations that have been around for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, if not more, and we're competing with, I don't want to say fly by night, but new organizations that come up where their objectives and their and maybe their overall intent isn't to have the same um, legacy or the same, live up to the same standards. And we have to understand that there's room for that in, in, in new media. Uh, and, that, and that you, we might not be the, where people heard it first, but they get information that adds more context, more fact, and more perspective than they might from a, you know, a, a new media organization that tweets something out. And that changes in, in our teaching for sure, right? Well, it definitely does. I did want to comment on sort of the state of newsrooms where, which are shrinking yes. um, across Canada and um, the pressures in terms of you know, uh, lots of newsrooms with legacy journalists trying to get them on board. But really, there's very small core teams at these organizations that are dealing with digital. And <coughs> while, excuse me, while they're relying on, um, you know, the trust and they need to uphold that, there's, they're, they're doing a lot with very little. And I think that's a big challenge going forward. And they're all doing everything too, right? Yeah, and, and I think that's the thing too. Like, it's also just this idea of, like, if you're, if you're working and you've worked, like, at now or a weekly, so, like, if you've been working a certain way for 20 years, mm. And all of a sudden, it's like, actually, I kind of need you to be on the beat a bit. Like, I need you to post on Monday. <laughs> you know? Crazy. Oh, my God. It's, you know, something happened on Monday. Like, and there's this really interesting thing that happens at now also, where it's like, we, we, we're digital first, so we do publish on the site every day. But even, even if you do that, you're st we we're still very, like, there's, there's something about being slow and not first. But there's also something about just not being in the cycle anymore. It's right. like, I remember, like, we had this big, like, one of our the print issue came out on Thursday, and it was a big story about the Aziz Ansari thing. But then Patrick Brown happened. That's what everyone was talking about. That should have been in, in the paper, but that was just real. You can't. Do you find that you have to convince, I'm not going to say traditional journalists, I'm just going to say a certain type of journalist in your newsroom, that they can do other kinds of stories? You don't have to write 6,000 bloody words. It could be an infographic you put out, and then you do something else, and then you do a little piece of video. Do you find that you still have to convince people of the value of that? Yeah, I mean, the, thing, the, the argument I always get from journalists, uh, and it's a valid one, and some of these are people who have been working in tele conventional television for 30-plus years, but that something's got to give, that if you want me to tweet and live stream, and uh, file for web, and file a package for 6 o'clock news, yeah. that I can't do it all, and something, something is either going to suffer, or something has to be taken out of the equation. And trying to prioritize, well, what's more important, web or TV? Uh, I've been asked to do a radio hit, because we're owned by, by Chorus, and we partner very closely with Global News Radio here in Toronto. There's, there's, there's no end to the demands on news gatherers, and I do think the challenge uh, on the management side, and on the sort of team leader side, is what are the priorities? And, and it's, there's no easy answer to that. 
I, I, on the positive side, I, I, I effectively use, you know, I used to be a reporter, a newspaper reporter, and I wish in the 90s I had the storytelling tools available to me then that I have today. I would love to be able to live tweet a court, you know, a court case. I covered the Carla Homolka um, case. I would have loved to have live tweeted that. I would have been great. And instead, we had to go back and sort of form the story, and, you know, it, we were behind. Um, or I'd love to be able to use data to tell a story about something large, you know, whether it's like a city budget or it's healthcare indices or something like that. And I've used that effectively, but you're right. Makai's right that there are only so many hours in the day, and I think a lot of organizations have kind of larded up um, you know, the, uh, the orders that reporters get when they go out, and uh, they haven't really done the prioritization. So yeah, I mean, maybe it's TV is the priority right now, um, but on the other hand, this story demands a deeper dive. So you know what, we'll hold off on that for six o'clock, but we'll go big at 11. In the meantime, I need you to, you know, send over your data viz to Patrick Kane at Global who will put that into a map. And I think it's those kind of choices, and even editors aren't used to making those choices. Because you're in TV, I do TV. I'm in print, I lay out a paper, I, you know. And so that part has got to happen too, and it doesn't very often. So in carrying all these loads, and you're right, it's not like the lists are getting shorter. The lists are getting longer for what we have to do every day uh, to tell the story in all these different ways. How do you have time for innovation? I think, um, you know, it's interesting coming from trying to teach journalists what they should know like five years from now, <laughs> six years from now, and really trying to keep our eyes looking forward. I'm, I touched on it earlier when I talked about audience, but really thinking differently. So in a, a lot of times when you ask, Students like, you know, uh, I teach a course in which um, students try to tackle a problem in journalism using startup methods and developing it over the course of 12 weeks, testing it, creating like a, a minimal viable product using design thinking and thinking about who they're creating the product for. Um, and, you know, maybe nine, eight times out of 10, they have an idea for a new website or they have an idea for an app, which is like, not the solution, and they think very much from a content perspective. And I think the challenge is, you know, not all journalists are going to be entrepreneurs and innovators, but thinking innovatively and thinking entrepreneurially is a big thing for, it has to be in the journalist toolkit, like it has to be part of their skills. And um, so for us, it's a big part of getting them to understand, it's not just what you're creating, it's who's reading it, how is it getting to them, is it relevant to them? Is it in a form that's relevant to them? Is it, you know, can it be part of their habit? You know, we've been talking a lot about voice-activated speakers, uh, you know, like Google Home and um, Amazon Alexa and sort of how people's habits, you know, it's, it's early, but a lot of peop more people have them this year than they had them last year. And it's thinking about different formats. So not that 6,000 word, you know, <laughs> treatise on, I don't know what, but trees or whatever, but, um, so it's really getting them to think about different forums, and, but that's not without losing sight of the basics of journalism and why we do what we do and that trust that's so important. But uh, for us, that's been a big sort of focus looking forward. What about you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think we have no choice. Like, at now, like, we, we have no choice. We have to be as innovative as possible because if not, we're out of, we're out of business. That's like, right. it's not gonna happen. So it's this thing where it's like, and, we're, and the innovation also is like, having the, being entrepreneurial, like having the ability to try as many different things as possible. So one of the first things that I did at Now when I started was I launched an e-commerce platform. I launched a store. My team is like, I have a legacy team. It's like, have they ever launched stores before? No. Were we great at launching a store? Kinda, but you know, then you start going, oh man, we launched a store, but we're not that great at customer journey. So we learned that and it's like, Custom content, like when I started it now, they did five pieces of sponsored content a year. Now we sell 50 months of digital residency and do hundreds of pieces of content every year. And it's just like, that's just a radical shift. And it's moving at a pace where it's like, it almost feels like sometimes people are just left behind. We just go to, we just, we just pass them. And it's like, and then they are still working and doing the exact same thing that they've been doing and they have a very specific view of what the organization is, and they get a very specific lens on when it's healthy or not. So th there are people who still base the entire health of the organization on the size of the book every week. Now you, now used to be like 200 pages, it's 48 now. But it's still working out because of the, the digital innovation. I think if you adopt that story-centric model and a story-centric approach to your journalism and to your product, and you think not, okay, how do we fit this story in all these different platforms, but you, you look at the story and, and ask what it demands. What are the, how, would, how would an audience want to or need to engage with the information 
that's coming out in relation to this story. And maybe it's a story that fits better on TV and doesn't work on social. Or maybe it's a story that is really going to resonate on social, but on a, in a conventional video platform or a TV platform, it won't really find an audience. And if that platform that is best for that story doesn't exist, then try and innovate and try and create it. Uh, and, and I think that you have to, you know, as, as journalists, it, it's all, it is always about that story, the story first, and then use the tools at your disposal to, to um, disseminate it. Uh, I think journalists by their nature are conservative in their approach to storytelling. And, you know, we often get, uh, whether it's stuck in a rut or we just, we're very good at what we do, the way we do it. So introducing innovation can be really, really tough. Every place I've worked at, it has been. Um, and continuing that at CP, we celebrated our centennial last year and we are every second 100 years old in our culture. Um, so what we do is, you know, we, there's a sort of a nucleus of digital innovators and thought at CP and we are the ones, you know, we're kind of not walled off exactly, but we are on our own. Um, and we introduce things and we do it in an agile way, in that capital A agile, where you do it small, you do it, you know, you want to fail fast, you want to learn from your mistakes. Um, there's no harm in failing, but whatever you learn from that, you then take. And, and, and socializing people to that, that's okay. And then finding the one or two kind of champions that are on the other side, the reporters who get it, the reporter who is a master at tweeting or the, the person who really knows how to do like social media kind of videos, you know, 50 seconds. And then you get them to kind of do that and other people will then take notice and go, well, Bob is a, you know, I, I started here in 1989 with Bob and he's doing that. And that can have some effect. Um, you know, it is hard though, it's not universal, but in an organization that's across Canada, you know, I work in one too, it can be really tough to say, oh, there's a guy in Halifax doing this and that means nothing to the guy in Vancouver. And, and respect the space. Like, it's okay that social media can exist separate from TV. You don't need to, uh, when, when Twitter first blew up, every TV network had a, had a reporter or a segment where they would just retweet yes. on television. <laughs> oh and that's the worst type of television you can imagine. And yet we felt that that was innovative. That yeah. was what, well, we can't let Twitter own this, so we're just going to put up a big screen and just show tweets after tweet after tweet after tweet. And that, that quickly uh, disengaged people and, and didn't work. And so now I think we're realizing that Something can exist separate from another platform, and you don't need to try and always have cross-platform harmonization. But this is a good point. When you talk about, anytime you talk about entrepreneurial stuff, you have to talk about failure. You have to talk about trying and failing. And I have to say that working at the Walrus with only 30 people, it's a lot easier to turn the ship than it was at CBC with God knows how many people. Um, and they usually do just let me do something crazy and see how it works out. But how do you find culturally in your newsrooms, are you allowed to fail? Uh, you know, <laughs> sort of. He does it all the time. <laughs> um, we're, we're allowed to fail if we uh, plan it that way. Um, failure planning at for failure? I don't, you're planning for failure? Well, the understand. idea that we're going to try something here. Okay, everybody understands what the parameters are. Here's when we're going to do it. Here's what it involves. And here are the potentials. So if it fails this way, right. this is what we do. You know, the idea of failing so that we go bankrupt, that's not going to happen. The idea that we're going to fail so that 40 people lose their jobs because of it, we wouldn't do that, but if it fails, oh, and you know what, we're not going to be able to get that video out for another 30 minutes rather than, a, you know, right away. That might be okay as long as we telegraph. So, and I was talking with Ozma earlier about the, the you know, Star Touch at the Toronto Star was a classic example of how, how not to fail. Um, noble intention to try a new platform that got a lot of buzz, um, but they poured $45 million into it. They employed almost 70 people. They put all of their eggs marketing-wise technologically into that basket. And when it failed, and it failed spectacularly, they had nothing. And it took them two and a half years to realize they failed. You don't do it that way, right? And they don't have the time or the money to actually sustain that on an ongoing basis. There was a way to do that, but they just didn't approach it that way. It's interesting though, because you know, as someone who's kind of moved from uh, the newsroom where you know, we made small failures every day, uh, to, you know, to academia where the pace is much slower. Um, I, I do have this realization that newspaper, newsrooms are iterative places. They're, you know, we are trying things new all the time. And this idea that I think part of it is desperation in terms of digital revenue is not bringing in the money that uh, news organizations want. So there's a sense of there's more heebie-jeebies, there's more anxiety about digital things. But I actually think newsrooms are ideal places for failure and iterative processes. It's, it's sort of intrinsic to the nature of the business. And, and I find that that's something that's really interesting as well in the sense that, like, 
like at like where I'm working now, we're 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 moving into a lot of different spaces, you know, like marketing solutions and ticketing solutions and custom content. And then when you enter those spaces, like your value proposition has to be super good. You kind of have to be really good at it because there's competition everywhere. There's risk everywhere. Like we created a ticketing solution, so we entered a space where it's dominated by Eventbrite. It's not like there's no competition. Eventbrite destroys us. So what is the value prop of using our ticketing platform versus Eventbrite? Well, you get free ads. So that could be okay. So then if you're, and then that sort of like goes, okay, well, that's part of the value prop there. And then that also creates a very specific type of client base for this product. Okay, so it's a neat, it's a niche thing. It's not gonna revolutionize everything we do it now, but it's gonna be a, a, a part of our mix. And, and again, it's about that mix. Like how much can you add into your mix Sometimes the more you add, like you start stretching your team really thin, some things don't work. But then in the end, you land hopefully on two, three, or two or three things that are just, wow, so that's what you are now. And that's, that's great. That's what you are now. So we are going to wrap things up soon so you guys can ask some questions. My last question is kind of looking at the audience and thinking about the students. I'm not going to ask what you do for a digital newsroom. I'm going to ask for a newsroom. What is it you're looking for when you're looking for new people? What, are, what, do you, what kind of skills are you looking for? What kind of personalities? What do you tell them when they walk in the door? Do you scare them right away? <laughs> yeah, scare them right away and show them their, the salaries that come in modern <laughs> newsrooms. And usually they run pretty quick. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I, we, we, I, think, I think that the, the, the same tenants that made great journalists 80 years ago make good journalists today. That, that, you know, always asking questions, always challenging authority, always challenging, um, you know, asking the why. Um, and now it's just about being able to do that in, in um, different spaces and on, on different platforms and using different technology. And, and I think that you have to be willing to, to try something and, and it's put yourself outside your comfort zone. If you've always been uh, a really great writer in long form, well, how does that adapt to, to um, using visual journalism, you know, and, how, and, and, and challenge yourself? And if someone's willing to do that, then I think they'll, they'll survive in a modern newsroom. A lot of the same, um, a curiosity about the world, um, a curiosity about the business itself, um, to understand the new platforms, the new tools, the business models that are there. I think no longer can we afford to just have the business unit take care of how you make money. I think journalists should understand how that works because they're going to be part of the solutions going forward. Um, and the flexibility, the idea that I'm not a print reporter and all I need to do is type 50 words a minute and no CP style. I need to understand the principles of what makes a good video. I need to know the rule of thirds for photography. I need to understand how social works and which platforms on there are going to help me gather news and put it out there. So that kind of flexibility, not that they're going to do it all at once, but one day they might have to live tweet from court. The next day they might have to write a 3,000 word, you know, takedown on, you know, the federal budget or something. So I think that, that those two qualities are, will get you a long way. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean it's, it's funny because I mean, I do a lot of hiring in the marketing and the promo side and, and one of the things that I've discovered is that um, especially with younger people when they're coming in they just wear a lot of different hats and they're great at a lot of different things I had this one guy who came in and he was interviewing to be my engagement manager and he was a he had a, a master's in microbiology from Oxford uh, he had his own film company so he's an entrepreneur and he was a waiter at the keg so he was great with people he ran his own business and he was a scientist and I was like man can he do the, my engagement manager on paper, it's like he kind of is around everything, but of course he can. So it's like I'm looking for people who are just like, they're just, they're into a lot of things. They're just, they care about a lot of stuff and they're just, they're smart. Um, for us, one of the things that I tell students is they really have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think that's, um, that's a lesson that will lead them, will, will go a long way because I think when we're talking about the industry in terms of disruption, with business models, the kind of jobs they have, but also reaching new audiences and bringing diverse perspectives to how we tell stories, to, to the stories that we're telling, um, understanding who we're telling stories to and who we're representing in our journalism is really important. Um, you know, don't shy away from a difficult story, just do it right, like get it right, um, and you'll, you know, you get more readers, you'll get, you'll, you, you will tell a better story. So that's kind of been the mantra that, that, that yeah. Can I add one thing? I also, I, I, should, I think um, new journalists and certainly digital journalists don't have to be young journalists. Like that, that idea that only people who uh, were born after 1990 can, can be innovative and adapt to new technology is so antiquated and so incorrect. 
that some of the, the most, uh, the people who have embraced and done the most with new tools are people who have been in the industry for 20 years or people who are getting into the industry now. Uh, and I think that idea of, of, you know, looking for that next Mark Zuckerberg is not always the, the way to go. Writing a story about that right now. Oh, I yeah? should interview you for it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to open up this uh, to you guys to ask some questions. Let us know if you want to ask one of us or all of us. Andrew, by the way, costs a dollar for every question he answers. <laughs> so, buck fifty, my bad. Okay. In the world, is a problem with the freedom of speech, with journalism? Uh, there's been over 100 murdered this year. So in Canada, we, we live a different uh, society. But do you feel any pressure of, of needing to censure yourself also here? Wow. Well, I'm a woman and I write about technology. Um, I get a lot of uh, hate tweets and hate mail and a lot of hate stuff. No, I don't feel the need to censure myself, mostly because I have a lot of people out there as allies. Um, but there are definitely times that I leave Twitter and don't look because things are happening on there and say, being, things are being said about me or about one of my writers that are painful to read. So not censuring, but also not immersing myself in the hate. I think there's an increasing, uh, and I'm not sure if this plays right, right into your question, but I think there's a, a trend, as I mentioned, with the political parties renting their own broadcast equipment. Or we, we're in a, we had an incident last year involving one of our camera operators who was at a crime scene um, in Hamilton, uh, or an accident scene, and was arrested uh, needlessly uh, for being on location with his camera. And the police were very aggressive and took him down and handcuffed him and took away his camera. And that, that process is now before the courts, or that incident is now before the courts. But we're seeing larger and larger uh, public institutions and public bodies like police uh, they, in, in Toronto and in many cities across the, the country, they've digitized their scanners. So where for decades, media outlets were able to listen to a police scanner and go and report on the stories that we felt were important. Now we rely on police sending out tweets to mainstream media, but also to the public at large, when they feel an incident reach, reaches the threshold where the public should be informed. That was never the police's role. It was the media's role um, to determine what stories met our mandate uh, to be to be public and um, and so we're seeing that time and time again not just with police and political parties but with lots of institutions who are using social media to go right to their audience and bypassing media and I think that's something we need to be mindful controlling of. the message basically yeah uh, yeah for for us um, no real um, move to censure self censure um, or self censor sorry um, uh, Angela touched on Twitter Twitter is a cesspool. <laughs> Um, it's an effective tool for news gathering, but it is a terrible tool to get public sentiment. So if you write a story or you're asking questions and people are all over you on Twitter, um, we don't take that as representative of maybe we're doing something wrong here because people mobilize very quickly on Twitter, special interest groups or just strands of you know, social outcasts even. And if we elevate that to being the mainstream or our audience, that's problematic. Not that you don't listen to it, but no, um, and to sort of contrast that with, you know, journalists in Syria or in Russia, people in Russia have hunting accidents in downtown Moscow, it seems. That is not what, you know, what happens here. And thankfully, I don't see that changing much. I mean, people complained under the Harper regime that there, there was some muzzling going on. But even then, compared to what it's like internationally, we have it really good here. You had your mic up for a minute, no? I was, uh, when you were talking about uh, leaders bypassing um, the news, I was thinking of the most famous one. <laughs> Which we're not going to mention. Um, questions? Brian, on, okay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, with the troubles that are going on in local news in terms of the um, attention that's been focused on the lack of local reporting and seemingly the amount of local reporting that goes on in areas related to like car crashes or school closures or like incidents involving like, m like things that seem menial or trivial, um, is there kind of like a push to get more um, like conversations going along with public issues related to say transit or homelessness or any of the city issues that are going on getting like a media presence or a personality to share those stories on a platform such as the news broadcast yeah three. <laughs> yeah i think that there's um i mean local news unfortunately toronto uh, i think we're, we're fairly well served in a lot of ways there's five tv networks that broadcast here uh three or four newspapers that publish on a daily basis uh, three or four news radio stations. 
But I think what we, where we've seen it impact the most are cities like Barrie or Guelph or Kitchener, Peterborough, that have lost, uh, Chris, uh, Kingston, that have lost local news outlets and oftentimes are the only news outlets in those communities. Um, one thing that we're trying to do at, at Global is um, hire uh, digital video journalists where we might not have a TV station specifically in Barrie or in Guelph, but we hire these multi-platform journalists and they're, they're doing a lot with a little and they go and, and cover those issues. Um, you know, car wrecks and fires are certainly, they're grabby and they, and they, um, they make for good visuals at times, but they don't cut to the core of what matter most to people or impact people most. Uh, and so we're making a real effort to identify uh, markets that are underserved when it comes to local news and having people um, work out of small bureaus, often one or two people at most, um, and, um, and have those communities serviced by, by local journalists. I'm going to be a little contrarian on this point and say that a lot of the, the, the downsizing of local journalism has turned into an opportunity for others. Um, the narrative right now is that we have massive news deserts out there that you know, no one's being served. And that is true. There are areas that have virtually no, um, no coverage and there's never been a better time to be a corrupt politician than now. But there are, and, and Mikhail actually mentioned a few in Ontario, the Guelph Mercury closed. The day the Guelph Mercury closed, a guy named Jeff Elgie, who runs a company called Village Media, hired the city, edit, city reporter, the cop reporter, and the managing editor, and turned it into Guelph Today. And that is now making money. The day that the Barry Examiner closed, he hired Barry sales guy, um, regional reporter, and that's now going. So, you know, the, with, the, with the ebb of traditional media, it could encourage a flow of other entrepreneurs that want to fill that space. If people want that news, and either they're willing to pay for it or there's a business model, you know, whether it's digital advertising or sponsorship that gets you over the line, um, there's an opportunity there. And I, I much prefer that option than a lot of the ones that are discussed now about, for example, the federal government subsidizing, right? And the Canadian Press is part of that, that conversation. It makes me uncomfortable, frankly, but um, there, that only seems to, be, that seems to be the only path that a lot of people are thinking. We need, we need public support for this. When I think that there is an entrepreneurial, you know, spirit still in Canada, that maybe there's an opportunity here to tell those stories. Any others? Oh. Hi. I, I thought I heard you say uh, just a second ago that uh, Twitter is very good for mobilizing people and, and sort of finding breaking news, as it were, but not so good for sentiment. Um, I've been part of a software company that was, uh, at least part of it was sole purpose, was to connect up to the Twitter fire hose and mine that sentiment and understand it as a, you know, an analytical set of data that, you know, let's say could be a, a layer to understand truth, quote, quote unquote truth. Uh, can you comment a little bit more about that and just in terms of how you see sentiment analysis being able to be a, a, a trust mark, let's say, for, for truth? Um, we use, we have a couple of tools in our newsroom that do exactly that. Um, we pay attention to Twitter and some other social platforms as well. Uh, my issue with Twitter is its size. Uh, about 300 million regular users of Twitter. Uh, our planet is 7. Point, you know, 4 billion people. And the 300 million, if you look at their demographics or psychographics, or, it's a fairly narrow band of human beings that are on there. Media, we love it because we're all on there and we talk to each other and there's a real nice bubble that goes around. Um, advocacy groups love Twitter because it can reach a lot of people, but they all have their own specific points of view. Um, politicians are on there, you know, uh, celebs are on there, although Instagram seems to be their, their favorite place. So my, my, my point was it's not, it's like you, you do a streeter, you know, to ask people what they think of something. Where you ask that streeter, you know, if you're asking it at a high school versus downtown Toronto, if you're asking it in Inuvik versus, you know, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you're going to get different sentiments. And for us to represent that, as we often do in media, as the public, or the thing I hate the most is Twitter is angry about something. Well, Twitter's always angry, but I don't even know what that means anymore. Twitter's angry. Um, you know, if you look at some of the tweets that media cite, the, the people have like seven followers, and six of those are the brothers and sisters. So how is that representative of anything other than that one individual? That, and that's my, that's my concern. And the fact that, you know, Facebook has 2.2 billion global users versus Twitter with 300 million. Instagram has more than that. Why we choose Twitter to be the metric of how people are reacting to something, that bothers me. I also like to think that it's not true, because if it is true, I should be lots of dead. Like, Twitter, a lot of the time, wants me dead. So I, I'd rather not be dead. 
So just sort of a brief follow up on that. So then so then is the answer maybe to have a blend of those kinds of metrics and measures that 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 seek to compensate for locality and, and some of the other things uh, uh, you know, that, that, that work against that notion of what community is online? I think one of the things that we, we struggle with is, you know, anonymity uh, is something that in conventional news, in, in, on all news, you, you, you uh, avoid. We would never uh, go with a source that was completely anonymous to the journalists and to the edit editors making, uh, putting a story together. And yet with Twitter, we, see, we feel comfortable often including tweets or embedding tweets where, where people's real identities are completely ob obscured. And we, we've done things before um, we, where we've had our anchors who get, as you point out, hate tweets and negative things actually go to the home or we've been able to track and source who this, uh, who this sort of troll is. And as soon as you go to them in person or contact them directly, they back down and they, they will not stand behind their comment. And so I think that if there is some tool to ensure that the information being exchanged or even the comments and views being exchanged were backed up by someone's name and their face, uh, then Twitter would be a much more useful um, or a much more meaningful sphere. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, hi, I'm an artist. Um, I'm interested in the fact that the, uh, the little blurb here suggests that you're going to talk about exchanging information, impacting how we exchange information. And you kind of talked about it only anecdotally and not directly. And as we enter this uh, era of feedback, as I call it, you know, I think about Jimi Hendrix and how before Jimmy, if you made a weird squawky sound with your guitar, you were considered a bad guitarist. And then how he turned that around and made feedback into its own musical genre. So will we see feedback in uh, news uh, journalism uh, enter into its own art form? There are, um, so your question is about reader feedback and engagement with audiences in that sense. There are a few companies, um, there's one called Harkin in the US, and um, one of their sort of, they work with several news organizations, and their uh, whole goal is to actually, a lot, uh, currently the way that people fe give feedback is at the end of the process, after a story is written, a video is, is published, that kind of thing. Um, so it's very much not part of the, the actual process of reporting, or the writing, or the producing. Um, and they work with a lot of major news organizations to get people involved at the beginning and have those conversations when it's what kinds of stories are we going to tell, how are we going to tell them, and get readers involved so that their input is integral to the process. So that's definitely one of the things that sort of leaps to mind as trying to, you know, not make it an afterthought. Um, one of, uh, so one of my many hats that I wear um, at Ryerson, um, I'm uh, one of the entrepreneurs in residence in a new uh, media in uh, incubator in which we're bringing on companies that are looking differently at news and innovation in news. And one of the companies is really interested in um, developing uh, a way of ga gauging how people engage uh, with a story. So understanding how deeply someone reads into a story. And depending on how deeply they read into the story, they'll see comments or they won't. So there's a lot of sort of sense of how are we going to make this engagement meaningful? And um, I think we, we know how we can make it not meaningful. Um, it's also how news organizations have dealt with comments. Um, and you know, this idea, as I was saying earlier, that audience was always an afterthought for reporters and editors for a long time. It was what we think is the news is the news. Um, so yeah, so I, I see things moving more in that direction ever so slowly here in Canada. I'd like to answer it on, for two, on two different points. One on the audience, um, the reaction forming a story. I think we've seen certain stories, things like the Me Too movement and the, you know, the demise of half the male Hollywood people, um, has largely been driven by social and people's own reaction. Not, not Mandarin's in Hollywood's reaction, but actual people and the studios are reacting to that and their managers and all that are reacting to that and actually make that the story. That, Enough people rebelled against the concept of Harvey Weinstein getting away with this publicly on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram that it became impossible to ignore anymore and action was taken. 
Um, and I think that's a good thing. And I think there is there is an example where you know the quote unquote social media mob can actually be a force for good. Um, the second part is more on the storytelling side, and I'll, I'll give you an example. In during the Arab Spring in 2011, um, there was a journalist that worked for NPR in Washington named Andy Carvin, and Andy never left his desk in Washington, and no reporter reported on the Arab Spring more fully and more quickly and more accurately than Andy did. And he did it through Twitter. He did it through crowdsourcing the people on the streets, whether it was in Tunisia or it was in Egypt, um, and would ask questions. Yeah, they'd, somebody would send a photo in of a missile tail that looked like it had an Israeli stamp on it. He wanted to, is this real? Are the Israelis firing missiles? That's a big deal if that's, that's the case. And he debunked that. Um, what's going on in Tahrir Square? Are, is the government storming you know, the crowd? Uh, and he ended up telling the stories about three different countries that way, using, not journalists, but using people who were on the ground to tell them and figuring out who the trustworthy ones were through communications on back channels and seeing whether their, their reports were, um, you know, were, uh, were replicated by other people. Um, and that was a tremendous force for good there. That was an, an example of, sort of UGC really doing something that nobody else could do. Um, and I, that, that became a model for a lot of us. He wrote a book about that, and it's, I know it's in a lot of newsrooms today, is this is how you use that tool very effectively. We, we did a, a project uh, in the last month at Global called uh, Hashtag First Time I Was Called, and uh, we started the, the series by having uh, five different prominent Torontonians and Canadians talk about the first time they were called a hateful word, so a racial slur or a word referring to their gender or their sexuality or their religion. And we produced these video vignettes and we shared them on social media. And the next uh, part of the project was sourcing responses and stories from, from actual people and citizens. And, and it didn't matter if you were you know, a, a politician or an actor or a musician, we wanted you know, authentic stories. And it was a great way to, to start a dialogue, but then really hand the reins over to our audience and allow them uh, a platform. Um, and I think there are plenty of uh, other stories where we, can, where we can do that, where we can not just source comments, but actually give a platform to people to tell their story in a way that is authentic and that they can own, but that we can give them the audience to, to be exposed to. Any other questions before we wrap things up? Nope. Uh, thanks. So I work at uh, George Brown College. I am a professor there, and I teach, I work with other teachers. Uh, a big part of my job, I see, is to encourage uh, media literacy uh, with uh, teachers and with, who hopefully will t encourage that with their students. And the fact is that a lot of our students who are in, you know, the 18 to 25 range, um, they don't do social media. They don't care about it. They don't do Twitter at all. Uh, maybe about 10 to 15 percent are in any way active on it. Uh, if they do, they are basically just uh, consumers. They follow a celebrity, they follow a, uh, a sports uh, star or something like that, if that. But, so the big channel, and then there's some who just adamantly refuse to because social media has such a bad rep uh, that they just adamantly refuse to get involved with any kind of social media to set up a Twitter account for an assignment or anything like that. Or so where whatever. do they get information? Or, or maybe they don't. Well, they, that's, you know, they, they'll watch TV or whatever, but they'll, they, they, they watch YouTube a lot. YouTube. Uh, but they don't contribute to any. So they're not actually, so a big challenge, I guess, so and I guess my question is, uh, are we really kind of overstating uh, this? And I mean, you can look at something like the Pew Research Institute down in the States, and the stats are not, uh, there's not widespread it seems, uh, use or, or uh, acceptance of a lot of social media um, that, that you know, you're talking about here, like Twitter in particular, right? I agree with Twitter yeah. and Facebook, but like all of my kids in my last journalism class were on Snapchat and Insta. Like they were all on it. So I think they're just going to different places and often we don't know about them as well as they do. But I'd say they're definitely congregating somewhere. But they're, they're using a lot of these to connect with friends that they already know. So they're not really using a lot of my experience here and from the discussions that I've had with professors is that they're not really using these to develop any kind of uh, personal you know, learning networks or connect with other people who have similar interests across the world or whatever. They're using these just solely to cultivate uh, acquaintanceships or friendships that they already have. Yeah, so, you know, I think you have a point that I, I do think that we live in a bubble in the media and because we are voracious users of Facebook and Twitter, and the narrative right now about fake news being a problem for Facebook, I mean, news on Facebook, even if it's shared by your friends, is 
less than 10% of the traffic that's on Facebook. It is cute cat photos and um, family reunion planning and, you know, my son's graduation pictures and funny, you know, funny memes. It's not, um, you know, parsing Donald Trump's latest, latest tweet. It's not that. So there, there, is, there is a point to that. I, I, I think I'm a little bit more in your court than maybe it's safe for me to be in my job. But it, uh, th th we do tend to overemphasize them. We definitely overemphasize Twitter as, as a, a source of what's really going on in the world. And it's not helped by the fact that someone like Trump, and I'll, I'll go back to even like Stephen Harper, will announce policy on those platforms. We can't ignore them because that's where it's happening. I mean, Trump tweets a lot of nonsense. But he also tweets stuff that actually has an impact, right? He's talking about ripping up NAFTA. He first announced that on Twitter. And so ignore it at your peril. Oh. All right, then I'm just going to say thank you to this panel and thank you to this wonderful audience um, and let you go to the next panel, I guess. Thank you very much.